Welcome, and I'm really honored to have all of you uh, join us in this virtual capital science evening program this evening. I'm very pleased that so many of you are joining us for what promises to be a really fascinating conversation about the connections between neuroscience and computing. Uh, as you may know, the history of modern computing began back in the 40s when a small group of visionary thinkers from a wide range of disciplines began investigating the possibility of building an artificial brain. And much of their work was, was inspired at that time by research in neurology or neuroscience, which revealed some of the workings, a little bit of the workings of the brain's neural networks. And today, uh, if you look back at their work um, in achieving artificial intelligence, it may seem quite rudimentary. For example, in those days, it was considered a milestone when an early computer was taught to play checkers. But those early pioneers were confident that they were extremely close to building a machine that could achieve the goals of natural language, of the human brain, of being able to process, of being able to do abstract thinking, self-recognition. And in fact, as recently as 1970, one researcher boasted that within eight years, quote, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. So now we're a century later than that 1970 statement and that goal still remains elusive. And that's in no small part because we now really are beginning to understand just how complex the human brain is and how it functions. So over the past, but over the past few years, uh, a few uh, multidisciplinary groups of visionary researchers have begun asking some big, insightful, and important questions about how our brain works. And their recent discoveries are beginning to give us a deeper understanding of the neural connections that could help us to succeed in building a brain-like computer. This is a really intriguing topic. And I know you're all as eager as I am to hear from this remarkable panel. So I'll get down right away by introducing our moderator, my colleague, Peter Littlewood, who is a world leader in this research endeavor. Uh, born in England, Peter earned a bachelor's degree in natural sciences and a PhD in physics, both from the Cambridge University. He then came to the United States to work at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, where he became the head of the theoretical physics department. <clears throat> and um, and that's also where I became good friends with Peter. After leaving Bell Labs, Peter did return to Cambridge where he served at the head of the physics department, but also led the legendary Cavendish Laboratory. In 2011, he joined the University of Chicago and went on to serve as director of Argonne National Lab. And since 2017, he has served as a professor of physics and in the university's James Frank Institute and as a fellow in the Institute for Molecular Engineering. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of London, the Institute of Physics and the American Physical Society, and he also serves on our Carnegie Science Advisory Council. So please join me in welcoming uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Lillard. Thank you, Eric. It's, it's a delight to be electronically with you. Uh, sorry, we can't be there in person. Uh, as you pointed out, what we sometimes now call machine learning, sometimes we call it artificial intelligence, Sometimes deep learning is now omnipresent in our lives. It drives cars, it picks stocks, it picks your wardrobe, it offers you movies according to your taste, and it offers you politicians according to their taste. Uh, these algorithms that run modern artificial intelligence are born out of studies of real brains many decades ago, which inspired ideas that were slow to gain purchase but eventually succeeded with the help of enormous computing power and big data but of course on conventional computers. The computing power and hence the energy consumption to solve big AI problems has been doubling every three to four months. Already information technology is estimated to use between five to 9% of global energy consumption. Uh, and some projections have this number doubling by 2030. Uh, this may become a problem. And despite all of this, why is your dog smarter than a supercomputer? Uh, maybe there's something left we have to translate and understand. So to discuss this matters, we put together the distinguished panel this evening. Each of these researchers has a very different take on the topic, from organismal neuroscience, from neuroanatomy, and from semiconductor technology. Uh, we're also going to ask for your input. We'll have a short poll of questions about your perceptions of how the brain works later. So let me introduce our panelists. 
Sada Shankar is the associate in applied physics and was the first Margaret and Will Hurst visiting lecturer in computational science and engineering at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Prior to joining Harvard, Sada spent over 20 years at Intel and led several critical technology decisions in chemistry, materials, processing, packaging, manufacturing, and design rules for over nine generations of Moore's law in semiconductor technology. Amongst his team's successes were the first advanced process control application in Intel manufacturing, the introduction of flip chip packaging, 100% lead elimination in microprocessors, and evaluating the system thermodynamic efficiency of computing. Uh, Sadas earned his PhD in chemical engineering and materials science from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. Eve Marder is the Victor and Gwendolyn Beinfield Professor of Biology at Brandeis. She's known for her pioneering work on small neuronal networks, which her team has interrogated by a combination of complementary experimental and theoretical techniques. She's a member of the US Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Science, serves on the National Institute of Health Working Group for the Brain Initiative, and is a former president of the Society for Neuroscience. She received her BA from Brandeis and subsequently completed PhD studies at the University of California, San Diego. And the third panel member is Bobby Casturi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago, and also a neuroscience researcher at Argonne National Lab. He has an MD from Washington University School of Medicine and a DPhil from Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. He's known for building some of the largest reconstructions of how real neurons interconnect with others. And we're hoping soon to be able to determine the wiring diagram of a mouse brain. So the format for this evening is that each of the panelists will make a short presentation of their own work to give you some background about what they do. Then we will engage in a conversation around the broad themes of this panel. And we'll also take questions from the audience. Please enter them in the Q&A and we will do our best to respond. So now let me turn over to Bobby, uh, whose videos you may have seen if you logged in to the panel early. They were playing uh, before the panel started. Bobby, all yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, and before I get started, I would really like to thank Eric Isaacs and the uh, Carnegie Science Foundation for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, I'm also incredibly pleased to serve on this panel uh, with, with Sadas and Eve. They are, I think, some of the eminent scientists, and so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Um, broadly, what, what I do and what many neuroscientists do is try to get a better understanding of the brain, in, in my case, particularly the human brain, which you see before you in the slide. It, it's about the approximate right dimension per human. So if you cut your two hands together, it, most of our brains would fit you know, pretty conveniently in that little cup that you make. And ever since I was young, particularly in the field of mental illness, uh, thinking about mental illness, I've been fascinated by the brain and I've had a broad, idea to try to understand it better. But of course, as I get further on in my career, what understanding means becomes harder and harder for me to appreciate. So what I've decided, at least to talk to you about, is not to tell you about how we want to get a better understanding of the brain, but a more detailed description uh, of the brain. And to give you an idea about what I mean by a more detailed description of the brain, and to make sure we're all on the same page, at least uh, 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 in, in terms of what makes up brains, uh, I thought I'd spend a few minutes just introducing the topic by showing you some of the earliest data of brains from a, a very great neuroanatomist. Uh, on the next slide, please. So here you see a very early picture, I think, of a human brain done by Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who went on to win the Nobel Prize. He worked in Spain at the turn of the uh, uh, 19th and 20th centuries, 1903. And in this one picture, there's a tremendous amount of information, so I thought I would just go through it with you. What Cajal is showing you and what, what Cajal's one of his great discoveries was that the brain wasn't just one big cell or one big electrically coupled cell, which is what one of the prevailing theories of the time was, but it was actually made of individual cells called neurons. And here Cajal has labeled a few of them for you, G, A, C, and one on the side that's unlabeled. The second thing that Cajal discovered, uh, which is called the law of dynamic polarization, 
is that brain cells, unlike many other cells in your body, like skin cells or kidney cells, they're not uniform. They don't look the same from all different directions. Uh, for example, in the neuron in A, uh, a you might notice that there are at least two parts to it. There's a sort of brownish tree that sticks up from the neuron called the dendrite. And there's a black cable that extends from the very south of the neuron, which is called the axon. And Cajal said, these are different parts of the neuron. And not only are they different parts of the neuron, they do different functions. And, and we'll talk about what those functions are next. So usually when I talk about this slide and I'm a slight narcissist, I say, you know, this is pretty cool, but I bet I could have figured this out if I had the tools that Cajal did. Uh, and I think there's one thing in this slide uh, usually I ask my students to, uh, to say it, but I'll just tell you uh, that I really think is genius. Um, and, and it's these arrows. Uh, uh, and unfortunately for neuroscientists, there are no arrows uh, uh, in the brain. So uh, what this is, is an inference by Cajal by how information travels in the nervous system. Uh, information goes up axons, for example, in F, into the dendrites of the neuron A, out the axon of neuron A, and into the dendrites of the others. If you will, like Eric was saying, this might be the very first example of a neural network. And a hypothesis, which I hope to debate uh, uh, later, uh, is that this idea, which neuron communicates with which neuron, and that sequence is really, can, is really what most of the brain is about. That is how the brain transfers information. That's how it processes our signals. And therefore, if we understood that map, we would understand how the brain does many of its functions. Um, now, you might say, well, that's great. That was 1903. How come you haven't already made the map yet? Uh, and one of the reasons we haven't made the map yet is sort of illustrated on the next slide. So here, what you see is a sort of uh, a collection of stars, I think, in, in the nearby Milky Way galaxy. And I, and I use this slide to say that in your brains, most, uh, uh, almost everyone listening, we think that there's something like 100 billion neurons uh, and each of them make 10,000 connections with each other. So one way to think about that uh, uh, is that that's probably an order of magnitude or close to an order of magnitude, more than there are stars in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. Now that's good news and bad news. That kind of very sophisticated, you know, in incredibly complicated web of connections, we think underlies a lot of what it is that makes you, but mapping it, especially at the scale of synapses, is gonna turn out to be a very big data problem. And, and one way to show that to you is uh, what well, I'll present it in the next slide. Uh, so you may have seen the video that was playing uh, um, uh, uh, when you joined early. That's a video of, of, of a work that I did for my postdoctoral work, which took many years, where we tried to reconstruct uh, a piece of mouse brain smaller than a grain of sand, literally smaller than the size of that thing that you see in that hand. So if you could advance one next slide, please. What we did after sort of painstakingly tracing how every neuron and uh, uh, every piece of a neuron in that connection, uh, which you now see in those cylinders, was try to get an estimate of how complicated brains are. So if you, oh, just to show that to you, I'm gonna have to take that cylinder, which we did in the movie, and explode it to you now. So if you could uh, just advance one more slide, please. So now you see that cylinder slightly exploded and one more slide. And now you see sort of it closest to its full complexity. And, and this is the part that fascinates me. This is literally less than 0.1% of the mouse brain. It's unbelievably complicated with various connections of axons and dendrites. And yet there must be rules because mice from mouse to mouse to mouse seem approximately the same. They seem to behave approximately the same. So figuring out those rules is the goal. It turns out, of course, um, um, if you could uh, advance it on the next slide, that if we, could, we think that if we could do this, at the scale of a human brain, uh, uh, um, um, uh, thank you. We think that there are uh, uh, a lot of benefits and I'll tell you what the downside is. So for example, there's a strong idea, which we, will, we might argue that many of our memories and our traits and our skills are in that map of connection. There's also an idea that for many mental illnesses like schizophrenia or potentially autism, these are failures of miswires uh, between neurons. And so if we knew what the control looks of the standard brain look like, we might be able to compare them to these disease, uh, disease brains and see what the result is. And then the very last uh, uh, piece, which Peter alluded to, uh, is that there are many things that our brains can do that even the, the best algorithms can't do. And just in the interest of time, I'll tell you the one thing that fascinates me and perhaps most related to microprocessors, all human brains, to some approximation, 
Einstein, solving relativity, or just watching TV, work on about 20 watts of energy. Uh, most of the light bulbs in the rooms where you are are probably 60 watts of energy. Uh, so even though brains are inefficient in some other energy terms, as Sadat will tell us, they seem much more efficient than our algorithms. Now, the downside of doing all of this is to collect the data set for even a mouse brain will be more data than has ever been collected about a single thing, probably than in the history of the uh, uh, in the history of uh, humanity, probably. And just to leave you with this idea, I thought I would leave you with this last slide because something else that I think might be worth discussing is that what we're really talking about is doing science at some scale, at big science, if you will. And, and I haven't decided, but I'm curious about the discussion. Understanding brains might be something that's a big science project, very much like going to the moon. Here, I've just put the speech that John F. Kennedy gave in, uh, at Rice University in 1962 uh, um, when we went to the moon. I, I put this up because I really like this speech, and I also like thinking about when presidents used to talk like this about science. So I found all, uh, but the most important part of this for me was when Kennedy says in the, sex, the second line, we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard, because the goal organizes us and measures the best of our skills. And perhaps the most important thing we will learn from brains is not really how brains work, like I started with, but how we can use them to make our algorithms and computers better. Thank you very much. So I should start. Um, I'm Eve Murder, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this. And we're going to um, change scales in a minute. And I'd just like to say I've spent my entire scientific career working on a small nervous system. It's a nervous system that comes from crabs and lobsters. And these animals live in the North Atlantic. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about that as a way of sort of illustrating some of the fundamental features of nervous systems, which are, I think, very different from the features that we now use in computing, but maybe we would want to use in computing going forward. And the topic I'm going to be talking to you about is differential resilience to perturbations of circuits with similar performance. And the next slide, please. And we all know, every two-year-old knows, that each animal, including humans, of course, is different. And the question is, how different? How different are the brains of two individuals? And then how can they respond reliably to perturbations? And what are the limits and benefits of differential responses to perturbation? And if we think about the way um, medicine is thinking about response to COVID, this all goes back to really understanding the mechanisms of differential resilience to perturbations in otherwise healthy animals. Um, so the next slide. So I'm going to um, skip to a very simple um, computational uh, experiment, if you will, that was done a number of years ago by Astrid Prince, who was then a postdoc in my lab. And what she wanted to do was to build a model of uh, the circuit that we work on. It's called the pyloric um, circuit of the crab. And this circuit um, produces a triphasic pattern. And you can see it here, a B, LP, PY, AB, LP, PY. And this is an example of a central pattern generator or a circuit which produces rhythms in the absence of sensory um, inputs. And the whole question about how you build a rhythmic circuit and how you use these to power movement is one that has preoccupied people for quite a long time. And if you think about it, this circuit, um, which is runs part of the animal's stomach is very similar in, in um, ethos, if you will, to the kinds of respiratory circuits that keep you breathing. Now, like the respiratory circuits in you, the circuit is ongoing in the animal at all times. Um, and what Astrid wanted to do was to build a computational model of it. And here, what she, can I see the next slide, please? What she did is she looked for circuits that had this canonical behavior, um, ABP, ABPD, LPPY, and she um, built 20 million model circuits using computers. And then she selected um, from that population the circuits that produced the quote unquote canonical pyloric rhythm. And here you see two of them. And as you can see, model network one and model network two are producing very similar behavior. Um, nonetheless, if you look in the underlying component parameters, that is to say, 
the parameters that give rise to this circuit output, you see they're quite different. So on the, what you see in the first set of color bars are the conductance densities of some of the ion channels and in individual neurons. And what you see in the lower line are the um, synaptic conductances. And so what you can see on the left, the PY to LP synapse is small, whereas on the right, it's big. The H current, that's a specific kind of channel or protein in the membrane is big in the left and it's small on the right. And together, if you look at the two sets of parameters, you can see that they're very, very different, but nonetheless, they're working together to produce dynamics, which are very, very similar. So taking the face value, this is a way of thinking about how in your brain, the synaptic strengths and maybe in some of the wiring and the numbers of channels in the membrane might be very different, although you and the person sitting next to you might have very similar um, behaviors under certain conditions. So when we saw this, we immediately asked ourselves, well, what about biological systems? And we went and measured the equivalent in animals of these synaptic strengths and the conductance densities. We measured a whole bunch of these parameters and we discovered there was about a two to six fold range across individual animals in every single parameter we measured. So at that point, we started to realize there were multiple solutions to producing very similar healthy animals. And at the same time, we immediately realized that even though you could have two animals with very different sets of underlying components that gave rise to similar behaviors, probably if you start perturbing them, you might reveal those differences. And that's what we see here. The perturbation we chose to study was the effects of temperature. And so now crabs live in the ocean and temperature is a perturbation they see all the time. So here you see seven degrees, 11 degrees, 15 degrees, 19 degrees, 23 degrees. And you can see the network gets faster and faster as we get warmer and warmer, but the characteristic triphasic rhythm is maintained. And then part B, you can see the connectome, that's what Bobby's trying to get for a mouse and human brains, that is to say the wiring diagram, this is the wiring diagram. But remember, each animal, which always produces this very similar behavior and always responds well to temperatures in this range. If I could see, um, so that tells you that in the temperatures that they're built to, um, to uh, respond to in the normal, in their normal environment, they all behave well and robustly. They're healthy. If you go to the next slide, you can see that if we now give them much warmer temperatures, extreme temperatures, like some of us are seeing now, you see what we'll call crashes, that is to say disturbances or disruptions in their behaviors. And interestingly, now you're seeing the evidence of those different underlying structures as every single animal crashes differently. So this is telling you that if you didn't perturb the animals, you would never see the impact of that underlying differences. Just like if we weren't exposed to COVID, many people might otherwise never show the weaknesses that allow them to become very, very sick when exposed to COVID. Now, I just like to show you one more um, slide in the next slide. And that is to say in 2012, we did the equivalent experiment, but instead of seeing crashes at 25 degrees, as I showed you before, we went all the way up to 36 degrees and the system behaved very well. And that was because the winter of 2012, um, we never had a winter. The crab habitat was six degrees warmer than normal. And these animals have or showed long-term adaptation over many, many months to living in a too warm habitat. So 2020 is, appears to be headed in the same direction. So one of the other really interesting features is animals have adaptation mechanisms that work on every kind of time scale. And one of the puzzles is trying to figure out what we can do to extend or expand the dynamic range. Now, I may have one more minute and I would just like to say in terms of thinking about what's different between brains and computers. 
brain's neurons work on many, many, many time scales, time scales from milliseconds to many years. And they have mechanisms that allow them to smoothly slide between all those different time scales. And they do that by using degenerate or multiple solutions and multiple kinds of processes. They use it using parallel pathways. And they have all sorts of really interesting architectures that I don't think have been probably um, implemented in artificial machines anywhere as much as they could be. So I'll stop there. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so before I start my talk, we are going to use the audience to help us uh, solve about three puzzles. So we will launch a poll just now and it will be on your screens for one minute. So if you could select the answers, we will look at the results in the end to see what are what is your thinking. So we will just leave it for a minute and I'll be silent as you guys go and uh, do that. The host and panelists cannot vote, so we will not bias ourselves. There are only three, three questions which will help us solve the puzzles. Ten more seconds to complete your voting. We will look at the results at the end. Okay. Okay. So I would like to thank Eric and Peter for inviting me and. Uh, thank my fellow panelists for uh, working together. It was a real honor and a pleasure to work with this group to put this presentation. So I'm going to go over, in order to address the clues to computing, I'm just going to go through three puzzles. Next. So the first puzzle is, are you left brain or right brain? Next. So it is known that the left and the right parts of the brain, the left and the right hemispheres are connected through what is called the corpus callosum, which is about 200 to 300 million fibers, which are essentially connecting two of the hemispheres. Next. So the left hemisphere, the conventional wisdom says, it's associated with being more analytical, more language, logical, scientific, and slow. Next. The right hemisphere is the big picture, feelings, emotions, religion, and fast. So it's, it is considered the more creative part of the hemisphere. Okay, so which one, whether somebody is left or right brain, in order to address this, we are going to go to the next slide, please. We are going to go to Austria in the 19th century. Uh, Ernst Mach was a physicist and a philosopher in the 19th century. And he is known for the supersonic flow, quantifying supersonic flow. The Mach one is essentially when objects travel with the same as the speed of the sound. Next. In 1898 at age 60, his right side was paralyzed. Uh, his right arm was paralyzed, which means his left brain had an injury. 
And that led to him actually stopping public lectures. He could not give a lecture, but he published over a dozen papers and revised over five books after it happened. So if you remember the conventional wisdom said the left brain is what the language and the sciences, but he continued publication. It's also interesting that at that time, Mark was nominated to the politics in Austria, that after the stroke, they thought that he could participate in the politics. So I will leave it up to you to figure out what that means. But moving on to the next slide, then we go to France in the 19th century. Louis Pasteur is one of the foremost French biologists and chemists. Next. Louis Pasteur at age 46 had a left side paralysis. If you look at the way he's holding the pen on the left hand, you can, see the, you can see the paralysis on his left hand. He got it at the, around the age of 46, into 40, around age 46, and his right brain was affected. So, but he needed help with walking, but a lot of the breakthroughs in research, including vaccine for rabies, silkworms, beer making, and a lot of this analysis was done after this. It would be, it is probably interesting, many of you may not know this, that at, the, at that time, the best treatment he had was they used leeches on him to see whether that would cure his left side paralysis. And I don't think it made much of a difference, but he had to go through it because that was the foremost treatment at that time. So now we have gone to France. If you move to the next slide. So now let's go down into the ocean to see whether the brain is left or right. The octopuses, which are essentially part of what are called cephalopods are considered the most intelligent among the invertebrates. Next. Their brain is actually a delocalized brain and they have about half a billion neurons and they have eight arms. Next. But two out of three octopus neurons, about 67% doesn't exist in the body. It exists in the arms. So now, and these arms have a remarkable amount of autonomy in them. So the question is, is it left brained or right brained? If you move to the next. Octopus are also very adept at camouflage. On the left-hand side, if you look at the figure, there's an octopus trying to hide in the background. You can see in the white region in the center. But the interesting part is, next slide. Next, please. Octopus are colorblind. Then how do they merge into the background? And this is one of the lectures I use in my class on material science to know how the material properties are modulated by the brain. So without color, ability to discriminate color, they are able to be adapted to this. If you move to the next slide. Now let's go from under the water into honeybees. On the left-hand side, you actually see a lot of honeybee constructing the honeybee combs. They're actually very wonderful animal architectures. And the construction of this hexagonal honeycombs require enormous coordination. Now, if you ask, it's a left or a right brain. Next, please. The lemon and the orange orders to which the honeybee respond, they essentially respond differently on the left and the right side. So there is a left versus a right difference. But no asymmetry is found when you look at the rows order. In other words, they are responding. The left-right symmetry does not seem to be that clear cut. Next slide, please. It was noticed even in 1814 that on shown on the left-hand side graphic is a honeycomb construction with a mirror on the side. The honeybee know to avoid the mirror when they construct the honeycomb. And these behavior routines are not fully hardwired and they essentially learn these construction skills. Next slide. These insects can manufacture tools. They can recognize faces and can even solve a visual concept learning tasks 
totally alien to humans. It's not very clearly known how they are doing this. So these insect brains are actually like miniature biocomputers, fewer than a million neurons in a volume of one cubic millimeter that they are able to accomplish that. So this is on the first puzzle. If you move to the next, the next puzzle is, is brain digital or analog. Next. On the left side here, you have a transistor which essentially switches and the signal is given at the bottom in red color. It essentially is off and then it switches on in a step function. On the right hand side is a neuron where it was off, then it switches on and switches off. So it switches, is it digital then? So if you move to the next slide, but it also seems to be behaving like an analog. There are 90 genes for neuromodulators, which essentially happen by chemical and diffusional transport. On the left-hand side, if you look at the figure, there's a blue circular object in the center that is a soma neurons head. And you have the dendrites and axons that uh, Bobby talked about in the earlier thing essentially going. Below the figure, on the left, you see some blue wavy curves. They are essentially spikes going down at intermittent stop. So those are neurons essentially spiking like a digital switch that I showed you. But then if you go to the top right, these, there is a pink purplish arm, like a dendrite, which is connected to a glial cell, which is given in green. And you see the glial response at the bottom. That that has spikes, which are actually different from the spikes by neurons. They are more closely bunched together and they are spiking positive. So in this particular case, they are essentially behaving like a hybrid of analog and digital. So is it digital? It looks digital, but in the brain, it seems to be a hybrid. Next slide. Is brain efficient or inefficient? That's the third puzzle. Next slide, please. Here is plotted different organs in a human body and its weight given in kilograms and then percentage and the metabolic value, the energy spent in each of them for the various organs. There are six organs, liver, brain, heart, kidneys, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, which is fat and residual mass. Next slide. If you zoom into that red rectangle that probably appears in front of you, if you look into the brain, 20% of the energy is consumed by the brain, but it occupies only 2% by weight. So you, one would argue that the brain is inefficient in terms of consumption of energy, but is it really inefficient? Next, please. Here is shown a human brain, the number of neurons is about 100 billion, as Bobby said. The power used by the human brain is about 25 watts. On the next box to the center is an iPhone 11, which has one, 100 to 12, 10 to 12 times fewer transistors than a brain, and it's using the same power. And then if you compare the two, the ratio of the neuron to transistor is given in the last box. The microprocessor to power is about 10 to 10,000 times higher than a brain. So a brain is doing all this with the same energy as what an iPhone 11 is actually working on. So now if you move on. So these three puzzles, which I kind of laid out in front of you, can help in extracting the principles of computing. Next. The first is, are you left-brained or right-brained? I try to make a case that it is giving you a lot more details into architecture of the brain. And it, you can essentially extract and understand how an efficient architecture is put together. Next slide. Is brain digital or analog? It is giving you Solving this puzzle will kind of talk about computing itself. Then the last one is, next please, is brain inefficient or efficient tells you about the cost for computing that Peter talked about in the introduction. So the reason I laid out these three puzzles uh, is it kind of gives you the underlying lessons that you could extract 
for how an efficient computer of the future could be designed. So that's, that's all. So Peter. Good, so thank you. Uh, thank you everyone, that was very uh, good. So we've, uh, well, we just had the poll results up but they went away again, right? right. Uh oh. Ah, there we go, that's right. So, uh, it's, so actually very interesting. So that the, uh, um, the, the, the audience has opinions on this. And, uh, and I think the conclusion, by the way, of course, is that everybody is right. It was a slightly uh, 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 trick question, but I would pleased that you could see that. Um, so now we've got uh, um, uh, the, everybody uh, sitting comfortably and uh, thanks. Thank you, all three of you for those uh, very uh, interesting and inspiring uh, comments. And I, I wanted to try and you know, address a few things. Um, uh, one question I have is, uh, is the brain one thing? No. Thank you. Right. So, so you want to say a little bit, a little bit about, about that, Eve? So. Well, what we know about all brains is that um, different parts of brains do different things and they're built from cells with quite different properties so that you might have a piece of the brain that functions primarily, for example, in analog that generates oscillations and other parts of the brain that um, are behaving more more as if they were digital um, and computing quite differently. So even within any brain, you'll see regions of the brain working using different principles, doing different things. Yeah. yeah. Of course, they work together. Right, that's right. So I said that, I mean, actually one of my favorite examples of this you saw in Sadas's talk, which is the octopus, which is about as, it feels like a very distributed organism that uh, uh, can do you know, really quite wonderful things. and. Um, and, 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 and one thing to add on to this, Peter, your comment and Eve's comment is, there is a lot of discussion on what is called the lateralization of the brain, the left and the right hemisphere type of thinking. There is argument in the literature for that increases the functionality. So it is an efficient way to have functions be mapped onto certain regions. It's not the left versus the right as well as as much as lateralization. I mean, maybe Bobby and Eve can have more insights into this. Um, I, uh, and let me know if I should speak louder, at least the host, please. Um, uh, one other additional thing I wanted to add is it's also not clear where the brain ends. Um, of course, there's a thing inside our skulls that probably contains most of the neurons, but ultimately those neurons have to connect with our muscles, with our eyes and our ears, and one part of the, uh, 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 you know, uh, one part of the brain could deal directly with the information coming from our eyes and ears. One part of our brain deals directly with the output into the motors. They're all linked together by connection, but I, I cannot imagine that there is a unified brain sort of anywhere. Yeah. So, so, so actually, but now, now as you're on, actually, I, I, I've got a. A question actually between between Bobby and and uh, and, um, uh, and and Sadas. So Bobby, you know, you you take things apart and you figure out how it's wired up. So suppose I gave you an Intel chip, and you could do this. You could find all of the wiring diagram, and you would do this, and then you would give that wiring diagram to Sadas and say, "Can you explain to me how it works?" If this is all you knew was the wiring diagram, would you be able to understand how even a computer chip worked? Um, so I'll let Sadas speak, but I think it again comes down to the, the hard word of understanding. Uh, I do think that before you did the chip, you would know some more principles than after you did the chip, after you did the wiring diagram of the chip, but I don't, you, but I cannot imagine doing that de novo. I cannot imagine starting just from the wiring diagram and getting some principles. But I, luckily for most brain mapping, at least the kinds that I think about, we do it in the context, we hope, of people like Eve and other neuroscientists, where we do have a bunch of prior information. So if I could flip the question and I could ask that, 
how much information would I need to know about a microprocessor before getting the wiring diagram becomes uh, 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 useful? Oh, that, that's, that's, a, that's actually, that's a tough question. I will try to answer that, Bobby. Um, coming back to Peter's thing, I will actually give a number so that you will understand what is the rationale behind my answers. Most of the interconnects, which are essentially used to connect between transistors, the equivalent of wiring that Bobby is mapping out, they have about three fan outs to a matter of under a dozen fan out at the most. Your brain has 5,000 to 10,000 connections. It's, it's a different beast within quotes altogether. That's one. The second thing is the way, uh, the, the, the way the interconnects are designed, I'm talking about the microprocessor now, is to reduce power consumption. So if you have transistors too close by, you actually try to connect the transistors to the closest interconnect. So you actually use the interconnect as a dynamical tool to reduce the power and getting to the signal the fastest. And it is dynamically done using software. So here is where Bobby can think through and say, where does the software of the brain come in and where does the hardwire come in? I'd like to chime in there and yeah. answer this in a different way because we know the answer to that question in small nervous systems. In the nervous system I work on, I showed you that connectivity diagram. We had that connectivity diagram in 1980, but if I had shown you that connectivity diagram in 1980 and had not shown you the dynamics, there's absolutely no way that you could have predicted the dynamics. And that's because there was too much information missing in that connectivity diagram. What was missing in the connectivity diagram are the things I was talking to you about, which is synaptic strengths and the kinds of ion channels that you had and all the details. And moreover, we know that that same connectivity diagram can produce very different forms of those behaviors as neuromodulators and other things change the properties of that sort of soft wiring. So the hard wiring is there. You can't understand how it works without the hard wiring. So the kind of work that Bobby's doing is absolutely necessary, but it's only the beginning of understanding how a piece of the brain works. So I like to say that the connectome, what Bobby's working on, is absolutely necessary and completely insufficient to understand how the brain works. And that's a compliment. Thank God, because we have to do something next <laughs> afterwards. What's next is you have to figure out how to put in all of that soft, all that soft information and figure how it's played out on that connectivity diagram. So that's interesting. So I, I'm gonna um, sort of uh, jump in and uh, pull some questions out of the audience. There's quite a lot of coming. We may not be able to get to all of them, but we can get some. So here's one question, which I think is a good one. Could you comment on the non-synaptic chemical signaling and conditioning that is such an important part of consciousness? Wow. It's an important part of everything. That consciousness, right. everything you do requires neuromodulation, which is the non-synaptic, extrasynaptic effects of globally released chemical signals. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, I, I sometimes like to comment that really the brain is a smart battery. This is a, in the sense that, uh, you know, unlike a computer chip where the power source comes from the outside and there are a lot of wires and there's sort of things that tick in the middle. Uh, interestingly, everything is sort of modulated and controlled and done locally, right? So, the, the, uh, so that, that's a, a good one. So, um, so uh, actually, question for you, Eve, which is a straightforward one, I think. So do neurotransmitters work similarly in different species of animals from cephalopods, crustaceans, insects, up to humans, just on different scales? The fundamental principles by which neurotransmitters work are common across all animals. There are many different neurotransmitters and they vary in terms of, in terms of how quickly they work and how many different kinds of actions they have. But yeah, all the general principles are completely conserved. Yeah. And, and one thing to add to Eve's, thing, Eve's statement is that 
some animals may have only 40 neurotransmitters, some may have. Nah, they all have too many. Right. No, no. The, the point is the numbers may be different, but the, in, in terms of the principle, I thought it was conserved across species. No, they all have many more than we know. Oh, they, oh even more than, oh, you are saying there's a lot more than even. Yeah, species. because all animals have small molecule neurotransmitters and then a host of neuropeptides. And people in the audience know things like encephalins and endorphins. Those are neuropeptides and they're massive numbers of neuropeptides. So, so, th so then, then I, would, I would punt this question to Bobby then. If there is a variety of these neuromodulators, when you look at the hardware, are they essentially, should they not be superimposed on some sort of a neuromodulation map or something for that hardware to make sense then? Um, so I absolutely think that the right way to do it is to get all of the information, ion channels, neuromodulators, et cetera. I do uh, completely agree that without that information, we will no, be ex exactly like he said, not be even close to complete. I don't know yet how to do that not just me, but I'm not sure how to do that at the scale of the brain and yeah. superimpose it on to the wiring diagram. Um, I would say that the, the thing we can do is the wiring diagram, the hardware now. It might be in the wrong order. Uh, I, although I, it's very generous of Eve to say it's absolutely necessary. Even that I'm not 100% sure about. Uh, uh, about. Uh, but I do know that it's doable and many of our models of how brains historically work is based on this idea of how neurons connect with other neurons. If at the very least we can show how that model is insufficient, which everybody knows it is, but I'd still like to show it, I would consider that a, a forward progress. <laughs> I, I would like to add one thing, Bobby's being a little bit modest because in his electron microscope um, detail, there are neurons that we know are neurosecretory. So some of the sources of the neuromodulators, he could be able to look and say, there's gonna be a big source of neuromodulator coming from here. And so then if you make some guesses about how far those modulators might travel, there's more, there's more information there than just in the point-to-point -point synapses. Okay. And in fact, the other thing to add, which I don't know about the complexity, one way out of this, although it's not obvious it, it will work, is to get the hardware intact and do at you know at maybe at a bigger scale than what Eve does to simulate these other neuromodulators with approximations yeah. and probabilities and the ion channel densities and see whether we can produce dynamics that are similar to the dynamics that people see in vivo. And hopefully when that fails, because of course it'll have to fail, it will fail in some interesting ways that point out what we can look for next. Well, okay. I would like to just I, and I'll stop and say, to me, the reason why I still personally work on small nervous systems is because in the system I work on, I know what it does and I know when it's doing it right. And one of the problems we have in understanding large nervous systems and human nervous system among them is we don't really know what any, what large portions of the brain are actually doing and when they're doing it right and when they're not doing it right. In the extreme cases, we know when they're broken. If someone has a seizure, we know that, we know how to measure that, but we don't really know if a hippocampus in person one or a hippocampus in person two is slightly disordered or not. We only can tell when something's really badly broken. I get, we're getting close to the end, but I wanna get just a few of these questions sort of a, as, as a sort of a lightning round actually of doing this, right? So the, the uh, uh, one question is, do the connections change over time? And I think you answered that earlier that they do, right? uh, but, but in subtle ways. Um, uh, then the question is, you know, what about the lots of room at the bottom? In particular, somebody asked the question, well, you know, a slime mole doesn't have a brain, but actually it has very complex behavior. It has a very, yeah, that's right. That's so so, so um, the, the uh, so, so the, uh, but it's computing. That, that, that's absolutely right, Peter. In fact, I, I had it in the honeycomb example. What is intelligence and what is computing itself 
needs to be questioned. Sure. Because the traditional way, our way of doing the von Neumann type architecture and a Boolean logic is one way we know how computers work. They have worked for 50 years. But the question is slime mold and even more plants, mycorrhiza, they're also computing. There, but, there is computation all around us. In they're computing in analog with signal transduction molecules often. So they're computing in slow concentration changes um, of calcium or other kinds of molecules. So it's a very different kind of computation than you see with fast signaling. Um, so good. So, so this, okay, so one last uh, science fiction question, which I think is good. So we hear a lot about this. So, um, uh, so I'm going to ask the panelists to vote, actually. So the question is, what is the probability of the construction of a bio-neuro hybrid AI that uses neural materials as part of a computation system? I would say one in 10,000 or lower. I think it's silly because neurons are pretty fragile. And if you're going to build something, you should build it something that isn't as fragile as neurons. Bobby? I may have misunderstood the question, but, it, it, uh, but if the idea is when are human brains and, and computers going to talk directly to each other, some of this happens in the world of intervention with people with spinal cord injury where they implant electrodes into brains and and, and people learn to use those electrodes to move. So, so that version happens. I think anything formal or, or more sophisticated or top-down plan seems unlikely. Yeah. No, that, that's, I, well, I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of good. There are lots of actually very good questions on here. Maybe we'll be able to get back to some of them uh, uh, offline. Uh, but I feel I, I should now, so firstly, you know, really thank the panelists. That was a great discussion. It's actually wonderful to get people with such very different but complementary perspectives uh, together and, and, and see these ideas bounce around. Certainly for those of you who are uh, who are participants around here, uh, you know, several hundred participants actually came to listen to this. That's really uh, uh, very, very impressive. I want to thank you all for your patience and for doing this. And again, to thank uh, Eric Isaacs and uh, Carnegie Science uh, for being able to showcase this. So let me just turn it back to Eric. Thanks, Peter. And thank you again to our panel, to Eve, Bobby, Sadas, and you, Peter, for a really fascinating uh, conversation, digging into um, what's uh, obviously very complex, but exciting and, and very forward-looking set of uh, problems. I also want to thank the audience, as Peter did, for joining us every time. It's great. And and we really thank you for, uh, as we launch our fall series, the new series of the Capital Science Evenings, which, uh, as you know, we normally do in person here uh, at our P Street location, but we're delighted you could join us this way. Um, I hope you'll come back to join us next month. We have two different extraordinary uh, lectures at that point, uh, two extraordinary scientists. Our first will be Avina Dishek. Um, she's the Cavalier Prize Laureate, and she's gonna talk about our origins in space and then uh, one of our own scientists, Carnegie Cellular Biologist, Kamina Kostova, uh, and uh, her title is to be determined. So until then, good evening, and thanks again for joining us this evening. <laughs>